In this lesson, we are going to study polynomial functions. What are polynomial functions? It is a function of this form, a n times x to the n plus a n minus 1, x to the n minus 1, and so on, up to a 1 x plus a sub 0. Take note that the variable here can be any variable. It can be x, it can be s. So you can have something like this, f of s or f of t. This means that all the variables appearing here will just be t. And here, all the variables appearing here will be s. Now let us suppose that we are using the variable x. What does this mean? This only means that you are raising x to non-negative integers. So remember that the exponents of x should be non negative. And what are these a sub n's? a sub n, a sub n minus 1, and so on until a sub 0. These are just the coefficients of the powers of x. So a sub n here is the coefficient of x to the n. a sub n minus 1 is just the coefficient of x to the n minus 1. So some examples of polynomials, let's say you have p of x. Take note that f here is just the name of the polynomial so that's why we have f here it is p that's the name of the polynomial let's say p of x is equal to 3 x 5 plus 4 x squared minus 1. in this case we say that 3 that is your a sub 5 because that is the coefficient of x sub 5 here 4 is your a sub 2 because that's the coefficient of x squared and your negative 1 is your a sub 0 and of course what are the missing terms your a sub 4 a sub 3 and a sub 1 are all equal to 0 because these are the coefficients of x to the 4, x cubed, and x. Moreover, the domain of any polynomial function is the set of all real numbers. We have no restrictions, correct? Because remember, we only have restrictions whenever you have variables appearing in the denominator, right? Because you want the denominator to be not equal to 0 or if you have square roots or even index correct but in this case since you do not have any variable in the denominator or you don't have any variable appearing in radical signs then that means that we have no restrictions hence the domain is just a set of all real numbers let us define a few terms first we say that the degree of a polynomial function is the largest power of x that appears so going back to our previous example of p of x being equal to 3 raised to x to the 5th plus 4x squared minus 1, the degree of p is equal to 5 because the largest power of x here is 5. I have mentioned this already that a sub n, a sub n minus 1, a1 up to a0 are just the coefficients of the polynomial and we call this coefficient here, the leading coefficient, and this term, a sub n times x to the n, is the leading term. The number a sub 0, this one, is your constant term, of course, because it doesn't have any variable appearing in it. Let us have some examples. Let us determine which of the following are polynomial functions, and for those that are, let us state the degree, and for those that are not, tell why not. Number 1, f of x equals 2 minus 3 times x raised to the 4. Of course, this is a polynomial. This is a polynomial with what degree? Its degree is equal to 4. What about number 2? Is this a polynomial or not? This is not a polynomial. Because it has square root. Square root of x is the same as x raised to 1 half. So that means that the exponent of x is a fraction. It's not a non-negative integer.
for the next one. h of t equals t squared minus 2 over t cubed minus 1. This is not a polynomial. Why is that? Because you have a variable in the denominator. If we go back to the definition, take note that there is no variable appearing in the denominator. However, you can have a denominator as long as it's not a variable. So for example, let's have p of x equals one third x cube plus x squared minus four fifths. This is still a polynomial. You have a denominator, but the denominators are just constant. So this is okay. So let's go back to this one. H of t is not a polynomial because you have a variable appearing in the denominator. What about this one? f of x is equal to 0. Is this a polynomial or not? Yes, this is a polynomial. It only means that all of your coefficients are 0. However, this is a special case when you have the 0 polynomial it has no degree. Why is that? You cannot say that degree is zero. No degree is different from zero degree. I will show you later. What about the next one? G of t is equal to 8. Is this a polynomial? Yes, this is a polynomial. And what would be the degree? Take note that you do not have any powers of x. What is 8 here? 8 is your constant term. Take note here that the variable you're supposed to be using is t, but t does not appear anywhere. This means that you should have powers of t. But what is 8? 8 can be written as 8 times t raised to 0. So remember that the constant is just the coefficient of your variable raised to 0. Hence, your degree is equal to 0. Lastly, you have r of z equals negative z cubed times z minus 1 squared. Again, this is a polynomial. What would be the degree of this one? Take note that in z minus 1 squared, you have a term of z squared, but it will be multiplied to z cubed, correct? And z cubed times z squared is equal to z raised to the fifth power. So therefore, the degree is equal to 5. Let us now talk about the graphs of polynomial functions. Here are the properties of the graph of every polynomial function. First, it has to be smooth. By smooth, we mean that the graph contains no sharp corners or cusps. And by continuous, it means that the graph has no gaps or holes and can be drawn without lifting pencil from your paper. Here is an example of a graph of a polynomial function. Take note that it is smooth because it has no sharp corners or cusps. And also it is continuous because you can trace it without lifting your pen or pencil. Now if you compare that with this second figure over here, this cannot be the graph of a polynomial function because first you have a corner here and you have a cusp over here. Like sharp turns. Moreover, it is not continuous because if you try to sketch it, you would have to lift your pencil here because it has a gap and then continue here. And then again, here you have a hole. So you have to lift your pencil again and then move on. So that's why this cannot be the graph of a polynomial function. In order to graph, polynomial functions, let us first start with a special kind of polynomial function. In this case, you just have one term. We call this a power function of degree n because you have only one term here. And of course, the degree of this polynomial function is n. Let us look at the graphs of power functions of even degree. You are all familiar with the graph of y equals x squared. Here is the graph of y equals x raised to the fourth power, the blue one. 
And here is the graph of y equals x raised to the 6th power. What can you observe here, class, as the power increases, the opening of your graph becomes narrower. Here is the graph of power functions of odd degree. You are all familiar with the graph of y equals x cubed. So it's similar to y equals x squared, except that for this other part here, instead of having this part, it was sort of reflected here. Here is the graph of y equals x raised to the fifth power. And the green graph here is the graph of y equals x raised to the seventh power. So it's the same as what is happening with the power functions of even degree. Note that as the exponents gets bigger and bigger, your graph tends to be narrower. Now that we know how the graph of power functions look like, we can now use this and our previous lesson, the transformation of graphs in sketching the graphs of some polynomial function. So for example, let us have 1 minus x raised to the fifth power. I have over here the graph of y equals x to the fifth. It's a bit similar to y equals x cubed, correct? These are power functions of odd degree. So from y equals x to the fifth to 1 minus x to the fifth, how are we going to get the graph? First, we will go to y equals negative x to the fifth. And then lastly, we will go to y equals 1 minus x to the fifth. So from y equals x to the fifth to y equals negative x to the fifth, what will happen there? y gets multiplied by negative 1, which means that you have a reflection along the x-axis. So this point is still here. 1 here will go to negative 1, and this negative 1 here will go to this one. This green part here will be this one. And this one here, when we reflect it, so that is the graph of y equals negative x to the fifth. Now, starting from negative x to the fifth up to y equals 1 minus x to the fifth, what happened? We added 1. So therefore, we move 1 unit upwards. So from 0, this will now be here. And this one here will go to 2. This point negative 1 will go to 0. This is now the graph. This last graph over here is the graph of y equals 1 minus x to the fifth. Let's have another example. Let us sketch the graph of f of x equals 1 half times x minus 1 raised to 4. This orange graph over here is the graph of y equals x to the 4. How will we go from y equals x to the 4 up to this one? So first, we go to y equals x minus 1 raised to the 4th power. So remember, you're, you're doing it from the inside and then going outside. So that's why you start with x minus 1, not with 1 half. So x minus 1 raised to 4 and then you multiply this one by 1 half. So what is the transformation from y equals x to the 4 up to y equals x minus 1 raised to the 4th power? You have x here and x minus 1 here. So what will happen? You will be moving your graph one unit to the right. And from this graph to this graph, what will happen? All the y coordinates will be multiplied by one half. So therefore, we have a shrinking. So let us now proceed from y equals x to the fourth to y equals x minus one raised to the fourth power. We will move everything one unit to the right. So this point over here will go here. This point here will go here, and of course, this point here will go somewhere here. From the pink graph, we will multiply everything by 1 half. So therefore, this one will go to 
one half all the y coordinates gets multiplied by one half this point here the y coordinate will still be zero and this one is actually also one half so that is a rough estimate of y equals one half times x minus one raised to the fourth power why are we talking about power functions? Now, it turns out that for large values of x, when you already have some terms appearing here, that polynomial function resembles the graph of the power function with the same degree. What does that mean? They would have the same end behavior. For example, when you have a times x to the n and n is even, if n is even, what would be a good example? You have y equals x squared, right? And it looks like that. So for the behavior, it's up, up. For odd degree, the simplest one would be y equals x cubed. And how does it look like? It's like this. So therefore, you copy the end behavior. So it's down and then up. Now, for this column over here, you don't actually have to memorize this because what is the only difference? You have a negative coefficient here. So that means from this, from up, up, remember that when you have a negative, your graph will be reflected along the x axis. So that's why you have down, down. So similarly, for this one, you have a negative coefficient here. So that is why this one would be reflected along the x-axis. Also, instead of down, up, you will now have up, down, like in this case. So for example, which of the following could be the graph of this function? You only have to look at the leading term, the term with the highest exponent. Now, remember, make sure that you look at the term with the highest exponent. If it were written as 5x cubed plus x to the 4 minus 6 plus 5x squared minus 5x, the leading term is not 5x cubed. The leading term is still x to the 4 because it is the term with the highest exponent of x. Since our exponent here is 4, it's even, and the coefficient is 1. That's positive. So therefore, the end behavior would be like this, up, up. Next, let us identify the end behavior of this graph. What is our leading term? Our leading term is negative 3 times x to the 9. The degree is odd and the coefficient is negative. All I have to remember is the graph of y equals x cubed. It's like this. However, the coefficient is negative. So therefore, it's going to be reflected along the x-axis. So it's going to be up, down. That is the end behavior of this graph. Let's apply what we've learned. Let us determine the intercepts, zeros, and end behavior of the graph of each function. Now recall that the zeros of a function, f, are just the values of x such that your f of x is equal to 0. But remember that what is your f of x? That is your y. This means that you're looking for the values of x such that y is equal to 0. And what are these values? You Graphically speaking, these are your x-intercepts. Because when your y is equal to 0, that means that you are on the x-axis. So you are looking for x-intercepts. So again, when, you, when you're talking about zeros, this are just the x-intercepts. So let's start with this graph. Let us solve for the easiest, the y-intercept. How do you solve for the y-intercept? You set x equal to 0. When you set x to be 0, you get that y is equal to 0. Next, let's have your x-intercept or zeros of the function. You set your y equal to 0. 
So when we set y to 0, we get 0 equals x cubed minus 2x squared plus 3x. And how do we solve for x? You can factor x. When we do that, we're left with x times x squared minus 2x plus 3. Is this still factorable? Can we think of factors of positive 3 which will add up to negative 2? No, we cannot. So therefore, we leave it as is. What are now the x-intercepts? You set each of the factors to 0. So you have x equals 0 or x squared minus 2x plus 3 equals 0. We now use the quadratic formula for this one. This is negative b, so that will be 2 plus or minus b squared is 4 minus 4. Our a is 1 and our c is 3 all over 2 times 1. However, take note here that this would be imaginary solutions, correct? So these are not real numbers. Not a real number. So therefore, we will no longer include that because when we want the x-intercept, we want to plot it in our graph, all right? So we only have one x-intercept. Lastly, we will be looking at the end behavior. What is this? Our leading term is x cubed. And x cubed would be like this, down and up. Now, why do we want to get these values? Y-intercept, x-intercept, and end behavior. By knowing this, we would we will be able to graph this function. Let us now graph our y-intercept is 0. So that means you have the point, look at this one, 0, 0. Also for this one, x is 0, y equals 0. These are just the same points. And your end behavior is down up. So therefore, it's very similar to y equals x cubed. Here is the graph of our function to verify that we obtain the correct answer. Yes, right? We have the point 0, 0, and then you have up and then down here. Next, let us consider y equals negative 4x4 plus 3x squared. Let us solve for the y-intercept. So again, we set x to 0. We will also get that y is equal to 0. So you have the point. 0, 0. Next, for your x-intercepts, set y to 0. So we get 0 equals negative 4x4 plus 3x squared. We have a common factor of x squared. So we're left with negative 4x squared plus 3. We now set each of these factors to 0. 0 equals x squared or negative 4x squared plus 3 is equal to 0. I only have a term involving x squared. I do not have a term involving x squared. Hence, I can just use the square root property by isolating the term involving x squared. So I have 3 is equal to 4x squared, which gives me that 3 fourths is equal to x squared. Hence, x is equal to plus or minus, do not forget, square root of 3 over 2. Here, 0 equals x squared. That means that x is also equal to 0. Let us just write this as points. As a point, this one here is 0, 0, but we already know that from here. And from here, we know that we have the point square root of 3 over 2, 0, and and negative square root of 3 over 2, 0. Next, let us determine the end behavior. What is our leading term? Our leading term is negative 4 x to the 4. It has even degree. So supposedly it's like that. However, the coefficient is negative. So therefore, this would be reflected along the x-axis. Hence, it's going to be down down. 
let us now sketch the graph. From this, we get that we have the point 0, 0, negative square root of 3 over 2, 0, and square root of 3 over 2, 0. From number 3, our end behavior is down, down. So you go to this part, the last part, that's down, down. The question is, how will now this part look like? For this lesson, we still do not know because we haven't learned it can be like this or it could possibly be like this, right? We will determine that in our next lesson.